Hey everybody, Frankie Slauson here, and as we continue my summer series called Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture, well today, I, I think I should uh, call this guy Mr. Pop Culture. I don't really call myself Mr. Pop Culture, but I guess maybe I could, just because of some of the people that I've chatted with, but only only to a smaller degree compared to this guy. His name is Mike Salis Salisbury, and he's known as what we would call the Branding Guy, and if you don't know what that means, we're going to talk about that today. I have with me Mr. Mike Salisbury, and uh, welcome to the show. Oh, well, thank you, Frank. Yeah, thank you for uh, being a uh, being a part of this. Uh, uh, this guy, Mike, here has uh, done a lot of different things when it comes to uh, pop culture, and uh, actually, you know, it kind of brings up kind of a cool point. I don't know. Uh, are you familiar with uh, a guy named Morgan Spurlock at all? I know the name. I can't. Recall the concept. I know the name. Well, in, in one of his documentaries, and uh, it wasn't the Super Size Me one. It was, uh, I think, oh, it, them. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it was one that he did on like movie branding, I believe, or, or like just a uh, like on uh, how things sell, how advertisement is, and stuff like that when it comes to right. like uh, movie things. Well, you kind of like you were kind of like that in a way, aren't you? Oh so, yeah, I've worked on over three hundred movies, marketing, selling three hundred movies. Yeah, they just came up with another one today, talking with a friend I I worked on. So I'm a, I'm gonna get you, sucker, which is a Wyan Brothers movie. And oh I, wow! He was bringing me up, all, he was bringing up all the gags there in that movie, and I forgot we worked on that one too. <laughs> well, you've done so much stuff. I mean, I'm sure it's like you know hard to keep track of everything that you uh, that you've been able to to say that you worked on. That's that's you know, pretty cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, so uh, when it comes to the pop culture, I mean, uh, before I actually get into the set of questions that I actually wrote down that uh, sure. I'm going to ask you, I want to ask you uh, kind of just uh, what got you interested in pop culture in the first place? I was just probably growing up in most of my life in the heart of it all, which is Southern California, surrounded by, in these by surfing and custom cars and rock and roll, all uh, this, this, sort of the hotbed of all that stuff in a way, the uh, suburbs of Southern California. Um, it's it's now maybe most of the rest of the country is pretty similar because there's so much exposure to this stuff. But um, I mean, I lived around the corner from for Bond Dutch work by George Barris, so I could go see that. I learned how to pinstripe by pinstripe cars. I went, you know, I went surfing. So I kind of got engaged in all that. So I worked then later on. I would work on music too, and album covers. But um, this is where it sort of all began. Wow. So so California is kind of like your you kind of your upbringing more or less, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I've lived all over the world, and but but most of most of my life in Southern California. <clears throat> okay, okay. I suppose you know. I mean, that you know. I, I guess a lot of people say you know you're either going to make it in California or you're going to make it in New York. There's no way of making it in between. But I don't know if that's <laughs> true or not. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing in between. <laughs> in between <laughs> is where we watch all the. We're all the people that watch all the stuff and, and, and buy all the stuff and. But uh, no, that's that's pretty cool. See, I live up in Minnesota, and I'm actually going to be moving. Oh, good. Well, see, there's a that's, Minnesota is a big center of marketing, yep. advertising. It's actually what the, I think it's the second or third biggest center of advertising, just because of what's all there, Green Giant and everything else. And we also have the uh, 3M. It's yeah, it's also the home of the uh, Mall of America too. Yep. Which I actually, I actually got to go to here a couple of weeks ago. We went on a family trip to uh, the cities for a family wedding. And uh, for the first time ever in my life, I got to experience Mall of America and Valley Fair. And those two are very iconic when it comes to uh, Minnesota and, and the United States of America. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I, I've been to uh, Minnesota and Minneapolis, but I've never been to the Mall of America. So. Wow, you'd be perfect over there if if, if you did a, like a little convention over there, saying who you were and, and what you what you did for your career or what you still do for your career. I bet you you get a big panel of people because everybody loves to shop, and if it, if it yeah, comes to true. if it comes to meeting somebody who's responsible for some of these cool logos or some of these cool names and all that stuff, I think uh, I think you'd be a success at that. You know, I think it would work out for you. <laughs> oh, great, thank you. So, I actually speak a lot. I just got done. Uh, last time I spoke was in San Francisco 
in April at a group. It's uh, it's called Hypo. The convention is it's mostly designers. Okay, okay. So uh, now that we get started with some of these questions that I asked you, and we're and most of the time we're probably just going to improv it anyway. But I, you know, sure. you want me to Absolutely. you want me to come up with some uh, some questions. So that's what I did. Normally, I don't do questions anymore uh, no, you, you, because you do it, do it, what, what works for you. Yeah. Normally for me, like, well, and I'll just say this real quick, it's like, when I first started doing interviews, I, I did re- come up with questions because I thought it was very important to, to look, or to seem like you're very professional, and I want to still seem that to this day, but after doing so many interviews, I realized that half the questions that I wrote down, I never got a chance to ask, so that's why. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I mean, I have answers for all of them. Oh, good, 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 good. So, as you were talking about being in California, how did you get started in being a brand guy? That's the first question. Well, the first thing I ever did, I went to school of architecture, and then I worked for architects. And, when I, and one of the architects I worked for, um, I did renderings. So, so I would, between semesters at school uh, at the University of Southern California, I, uh, I, I worked for architects. I also worked for other sort of design firms, and one of them, uh, did architecture work and they also did graphics and so I learned a lot about typography, typography designer. I learned about typography and setting type in junior high school. And then while I was there, I also started surfing and I started doing surfboard company logos like Gordon and Smith and others. Okay. And that just kind of grew from there. I used to illustrate for sort of cheesy men's magazines while I was doing this and then went to uh, I wanted to get into advertising, and and I didn't want to leave the beach. And so the best advertising agency that was in Southern California at the time would happen to be in Newport Beach. I walked in the door, showed a portfolio, and they gave me a job. And uh, uh, it was coming up with the ad concepts and coming up with, uh, and they were all illustrated with long copy. And then I went, then I went from there to Playboy hired me to be an art director at Playboy. And then I came back and went into advertising again. And then from there went on to editorial again on a magazine uh, that was in the LA Times called West Magazine. And in that, what I did, they wanted it, the magazine had started out sort of as a parade magazine and, and the new editorial director really wanted it to be more about Southern California. So I started creating uh, articles and uh, about pop culture, you know, the, the history of Levi's, the, sure. the custom cars, uh, the uh, Hollywood, uh, you know, patio apartment buildings with <laughs> all the weird names written on the side and a lot of movie stuff and uh, history of comics, anything that had to do with pop culture, but especially if it related to Southern California. Oh, sure, sure. Did you, uh, and here's an off question that I didn't write down. Uh, since you're talking about uh, surfing and stuff, did you ever get to work with uh, any of the uh, Z Boys at all, uh, like Tony Alva or? That's my neighborhood. Oh, okay. that beach, That's where they are all from, and then that's where uh, the movie, the feature, was shot right around here. In fact, they borrowed some stuff from me for the feature, Parish Band Shoes. For the uh, Lords of Dogtown movie. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That was a that was a really good movie. They did a good job to kind of recreate uh, uh, their life. I thought they did a good job on that. Yeah. This um, I think my secretary at the time was in. She took off a couple of days from here to go in because they were sitting around the corner. And then the director came up to a party here. I think it was a birthday party for my daughter. Huh. The actual guys. That word is the boys. Kind of, I was from another part of the beach, and them I didn't know personally. There was a big distinction between different beaches along the coast, just like neighborhoods anywhere else. Oh, sure. Venice is very. It, it Venice is in the city of L.A. and it's very city-like, and it's sort of like Coney Island. And it was uh, all, a lot of the other beach towns are like beach towns anywhere else, are more resort-like. And this is really hardcore here, where those guys came from. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure even back in the day, you know, when I first got started, or the whole thing of surfing. Because I watched that uh, movie, uh, well, not just The Lords of Dogtown, but then they did a documentary before that called uh, Dogtown and Z-Boys. And it seemed like yeah. back in those days in California, wow. I mean, it was uh, it was definitely uh, something special over there. Yeah, yeah this 
Craig Stessick, who was an advisor on uh, the feature, put together the documentary, the first one. Oh, okay. Z, Z Boys. Yeah, cool. So, uh, uh, second question here now that I wrote down for you. What uh, what brand deal gave you the most success? Well, in terms of... <laughs> well, just in, in terms... terms of, in terms of what's the most notorious one? Or, what, or just one, one that kind of that, that, uh, was your most favorite or, or one that you well, really... The one that's probably the best known is Michael Jackson. Okay. Okay. Correctly, a devil black and white look for him. Um... Went on to, which went on to become his signature, his sort of logo. You know? Okay. Well, we'll get into the Michael Jackson story here after this next question. Then, uh, are most of the brands you worked with all famous? Well, I don't remember the ones that aren't. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the ones that are. I'm sure there were a lot that aren't or weren't if they're, if they're not around anymore. Yeah, because it seems like like even like if I go like the grocery store, we have like well, we have some uh, off brand names you know, like uh, our family or hospitality or something like that. But I, but more like the you know everybody likes the like the Frosted Flakes or the Kellogg's or or you know like uh, Aunt Jemima for like uh, maple syrup and everything you know rather than the cheaper brands. But sometimes cheaper brands are all you can afford, or at least over here in Minnesota anyway. But <laughs> yeah, lots of different brands anyway. Uh, okay, now we'll get into the Michael Jackson story. Tell me, tell me the Michael Jackson story and how it all kind of evolved. And uh, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I had been involved in a lot. I mean, I could work on marketing three hundred movies. I did a lot of music industry work. I mean, I even worked on the first Dick Dale album, and uh, I had uh, done George Harrison and James Taylor and. Uh, I and Tina, and I had um, I had seen The Wiz, the movie The Wiz with Michael Jackson. And I yeah. thought that was while he was still with the Jackson Five, and uh, I thought he was incredible. I mean, he was holding back not to upstage everybody else in the movie. So I knew his uh, agent. So I called him up and I said, "He's going to be huge. He's going to be bigger than this." And he said, I really want to do something for him. He said, "Well, come over. We have a." Album, a cover for his solo album that we're going to come coming out with. Nobody likes the cover, the look. So I went over to see it, and it was pretty dopey photograph. It was him, sure. almost as though it was like an ad for Sears, you know, modeling kids' clothes. And I said, "Well, okay." I said, "This it has to be a there has to be a bigger introduction of him as a solo act than this." So I went back and I got a uh, fashion illustrator, and I wanted her to design him as though this was a he was a Vegas star already like Frank Sinatra and so we yeah. designed a, we did drawings of him in a tuxedo and I took him back to the uh, office of the uh, of the agent and I presented the drawings and he hemmed and hawed and he didn't like him he said ah, I don't know he was, all of a sudden this is a huge office on Sunset Boulevard at the end of the strip right before Beverly Hills and it had giant ceiling, must be 20 foot ceiling, with big windows and these drapes over the windows. And all of a sudden, I heard this little voice, I like it. And then Michael comes out from behind the drape and he comes over and looks at the drawings. He said, I like the drawings. He said, uh, I want to do that. So in the tuck, he said, I just have one request that I have. They can wear white socks. I said, well, if they wear white socks, we want to get loafers too because I want it to look like Gene Kelly looked like when he wore white socks. Sure. And then it will roll your cuffs up so we can see the white socks and then we went and shot it and I had him put his hands in his pockets to pull the pants up so you could see the white socks which is the pose which is on the cover of Off the Wall oh wow oh wow that's pretty that's pretty amazing do a lot of people know that you're the guy behind the famous white glove and, and, and that story that you just told the who, who knows I'm sorry do a lot of people know that you're the guy behind that famous uh, story? Like in the jet music business, sort of. Okay, issue. but I'm and not. And then we got him the tuxedo. Uh, sure. My wife styled it, and she got him a, a East Saint Laurent woman's tuxedo because it was the only thing that was fitting because it was so small. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. And how did you react when you found out that he he died? Oh, you know, I know exactly where I was, and I know, I mean, I just walked into the office, and one of the guys working for me turned around and told me. Oh, wow. You know, 
since I mean, how do you respond? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, just uh, I'm sure just you were shocked. I'm sure because you never expected to hear that type of news. Not especially when he was that young. You know? Yeah. Yeah, because he was only what fifty, I believe, when he died. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. It's pretty well. What they do? Uh, well, I'll tell you an off offset Michael Jackson story real quick. Uh, uh, there's a guy out of Florida who, well, you know, you know how they, there's people that do tribute bands and stuff like that to try to yeah. be try to recreate everything. Well, uh, sometimes you find ones that are really good, and sometimes you find ones that absolutely suck. Well, right. there's a guy out of Florida named Robert Hyman who was a producer of a show called The Ultimate Thriller Tour. Now, this is actually something that I went to in a town called Bemidji, Minnesota about a month and a half ago uh, that he gave me free tickets for because I interviewed him earlier this summer. And they actually do a hell of a job giving you the what would be called the closest you'd ever come to an actual Michael Jackson concert. Where they actually yeah. got some people like if you've heard of a guy named Michael Prince who was like Michael Jackson's music guy for like twenty five years, some of his actual choreographer dancers and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and they put they put a lot of time. They actually have gone, you know, all over the world doing since Michael Jackson died, uh, re- trying to keep his memory alive in that sense. And uh, I think there was a, a quite a, uh, quite a success if you're a Michael Jackson fan. So I just wanted to let you know that in case you I don't know if you knew that or not. <laughs> no. Uh-huh. So it's, uh, so it's people that try to do tributes, and I've seen some tributes too that aren't so great. But this one to me, and I'm sure to most people, if, and if you saw it, you'd probably think it's. I don't know how many shows you've ever been to with Michael Jackson, but you'd probably think that he's still alive. You know when they yeah, when you see cool. it. So anyway, so the next question I have for you is: uh, I noticed you did some work with the Nintendo. Would you like to explain yeah. some of the things you did with Nintendo? Um, I think it was about 89, and we, I think they had a whole new, I just looked it up, and they had, it was a Game Boy at that time, and I they, think so, yeah. and we, we repackaged all their games for them. Uh, I think it was uh, coincidental with the release of that of Game Boy. Uh-huh. Well, Game Boy was really popular too when it came out, just like as popular as Nintendo was. Because I, you know, I'm only 29 years old, so I'm a young guy. But I was like a little, I was like probably five or six when the uh, Nintendo came out, and and uh, yeah, who knew how big of a revolution it was going to start? Because now they got the Wii, and they got the Wii U, and they got Xbox, and they got yeah. PlayStation. Are you a big gamer guy at all, or, or are you just? Yeah, so I mean, we did we did the Halo logo, yeah, and yeah. The Halo Two, and uh, did the packaging for Halo Two, the basic concept for it. Um, but I don't really play any of them. I mean, I do. I went to when they were Bungie, and we went to Chicago and worked with the guys there who were developing the game and saw how they worked, and the guys who worked for me. Played the game, so okay. I just came up with the concept to put for the logo and for the packaging <laughs> after I saw it being used. Oh, that's say hey, that's 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 cool enough. I mean, you know, you you were definitely uh, contributed your part anyway, and nobody else can say that. <laughs> You're the okay. only one that can say that. <laughs> So, uh, because you got a chance to do all these different cool things with, with brands and stuff like that, were there any other career choices that you had if, if uh, you wouldn't have uh, done brands and stuff? I don't think so. We just kept It just kept developing and getting bigger, you know, and getting more work and more work. And okay. it's probably just being in the right place at the right time. And also, um, one of the reasons I got so much work, particularly movie work, because I work pretty fast and then I could churn out a lot of ideas. When you're working for... Well, when you're working on a movie, a movie, each movie is like a company, you know, and, yeah. and there's a lot of money behind it, a lot of people involved, and you have to come up with a lot of ideas and concepts uh, to to see what actually is going to stick and what anybody likes and what might work. And, uh, I mean, we used to be working 24-7 just doing, uh, beginning like with maybe 50 concepts in sketch form and then refining those and refining those. So I was relatively fast at doing it. And I think probably at that time, probably the the youngest person around doing motion picture marketing. So a lot of titles that were, that came out, like I did Jurassic Park and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and, 
Alien. So all those kind of movies, which were targeted that kind of audience, that age group, and uh, we got a lot of that work to do. And, and what are what are some of the uh, latest uh, films that you've actually had a, a chance to work on to do any branding deals with? Oh, like Moulin Rouge, I think was the last one. Oh uh, wow! Okay, that was a while ago. Okay. Yep. Oh, that's cool. So, so basically, what you're what you're saying is, well, when you do brand, brands, it's kind of you don't know what you're going to get yourself into. It's just kind of whatever, whatever somebody needs for something, you're pretty much the guy for it. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. <laughs> okay, okay. Because I never know how that that works because I don't know many people that do stuff like that. So that's uh, it's kind uh-huh. of. You know, it, it sounds like a fun job anyway. It doesn't sound too boring like I like like some people would probably think it would be. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I mean, if people come into you for. I mean, you work with the, whoever it is at these companies and with the movies and with records and. I mean, we've even done a baseball team. It's just uh, a lot of it is process. You go over things, go over things. A lot of it is just a spontaneous idea. You know, just this will work. Did you? It's like with the five hundred one. I mean, oh, oh. people think that that. Basic Levi scenes have always been called 501. Well, they really haven't. That was the stock number. And when they came out with a woman's jean that was cut to the same sort of pattern that the original 501 was, I said, well, you, before we can advertise what it is, what do we say? We have to name the original because we just can't say, well, but fly shrink to fit jeans, you know. Sure. Because at Levi's itself and at Footcone, the agency where I was, they always referred to them as basics. And then they had other products. So the basic was just the, the jeans we call now 501. So I said, well, we've got to give them a name so we can name the women's, the women's version. I said, why don't we name them what the stock number is? And if you ever see a pair of 501 on the back, on the leather, red, fake leather now, at the time it was real leather, tag, it says 501. And I said, let's just call them 501. So that's what I think everybody knows them as. But we'll start marketing that and, 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 and basically branding the basic gene, and then we can say now we have, you know, the original 501 now cut for women. Oh, that's pretty cool. They had never really had they, they 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 never really had a particular name except in how they'd be ordered by, which was the stock number, which is 501, oh, which was wow. given to them at the beginning when they were made a long time ago, Jeez. in the 1800s. <laughs> that's that's good information. I, I tell you, you know, I never knew. Uh, a pair of pants would be so uh, so interesting, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool, though. I mean, uh, I went, you know, I was looking around your website too, and uh, I, I saw some other things that uh, we haven't talked about, like uh, like your influence in the Rocky Four trailer. You're uh, doing some stuff with the Goonies. I I seen. Uh, yeah, we did a uh, trailer for them, and I. Th- uh I think we did the opening titles, but I know we did a trailer for them. A special, what you call a special shoot trailer, which is where, like, the Rocky was a special shoot. It's not anything from the movie. We actually, yeah. we actually created that on a stage. And then the exploding gloves are all live, and they're, they're replicas of the gloves and plastic of Paris with dynamite caps in them, and they're actually really blown up. And, oh, huh. uh, and, and that movie alone was pretty popular. You know, the whole Rocky series was popular, but I think that was yeah. probably... Three and four, I think, was probably the, the two biggest ones. Besides yeah, the first and one. I think with that ending, that's where they got the uh, the helmets butting together for Monday Night Football, oh, and they yeah. did, where they got the bud bottles were banging together. We, that that whole concept of smashing things together and blowing them up went on to be uh, emulated by a lot of other advertisers and oh, marketers. Geez. Well, that's pretty cool. And then your work with the Goonies, because I'm a huge, huge Goonies fan. I went down to Astoria, Oregon twice, once in 2008, once in 2012, and, and got to got to see what the town was all like and everything. I got to see oh, the wow. house. and cool. Yeah, that's the closest that I've ever got, come to your area as far as close to California anyway. But uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm a huge Goonies fan. And, t- and talk about that a little bit, about your, your work with Goonies. Oh, we, um, let's see, after... I did a lot of work for Spielberg. I, I, Goonies was after... Oh... <laughs> the first things we worked for him. And, uh... I'm trying to think where it came in order of stuff. I was after... Goonies was after Star Wars, I, I think. We did a lot of work on Star Wars. And then they, um, they needed... 
a special trailer for it, which you call a teaser, like I, that's the teaser I sent you about the documentary. Yep, yep. It's doing on my work. It's, and it had, so we had different variations. I could probably share a story about some time, but one was like where the, they all came up with a title reveal. A lot of them were like they go down in the cave and they're crawling across, and somebody drops a flashlight and up pops the letters backlit by the flashlight. Oh, wow. And I think that frame is on the website. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's on your yeah. I saw that on your site. I, I was just pretty impressed because, like I said, that's one of my favorite movies. I mean, like I'm an '80s kid anyway. I grew up in 1983, and I got into the Goonies probably in the '90s when I actually knew what movies were and stuff. And uh, oh. yeah, I mean, it's uh, and, and to say that I'm actually I actually have it on my YouTube channel that I can always send you a link uh, that I actually <laughs> to prove that I actually was down there and I made like a four hour oh, cool. documentary of it. And, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a good uh, it's a feel good movie anyway. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we worked on <clears throat> we worked on a book for it too, uh, uh, the cover of the book, and then you know we worked on stand. We did the campaign for the poster for Stand by Me. And oh wow! Yes, Stand by Me. That's another good one. I like a lot of the '80s films because you know nowadays. I mean, I don't know how you are when it comes to like. <clears throat> like in certain films, but I think back in those days, they actually it, they actually took the time to actually make a movie as great as they could make it. Even if it was a piece of crap, they still tried hard enough to make it good. And now today, oh, yeah, it's too much graphic, true. too much uh, they're, special they're, effects. They're churning out a lot of product now for a basic art for one basic audience. Yeah, know, yeah. So, and everyone's the same. I mean, week after week, there's another something from outer space coming at us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're on our fifth or fourth this, this week alone. And you can, I'll tell you a clue that you can always watch for. Um, it's like when they, when, before they released The Lone Ranger and, they, and the marketing materials were sort of cryptic. You couldn't tell really what was going on. And then before Pacific Rim, all the posters around here, because we're right in the middle of LA and Hollywood, oh, so sure, they put yeah. a lot of stuff up around here, that the people who are working on them feel somewhat like they're part of it, I think. But basically, the TV for Pacific Rim, it was pretty vague what was going on. And then the, the print was really vague. You couldn't tell what was going on. Well, when you know when they're... And Superman started off... It, I, I don't think it took off or made a lot of money for a while, but it was a little vague. When you when they're not showing what they got for sale, you can probably pretty much guess it's not going to be very good. And, you know, I'm told Pacific Rim was good, but it didn't didn't do much business. And uh, they must not have thought it was very good because basically... They really promoted it here at first very vaguely, you know, just kind of black tentacle-like things. And then when they finally started showing scenes, it was after it already opened, I think. And then, you know, like, they said the same thing with Super with Golden Ranger. Then they started showing scenes after it opened, but it didn't open to do any business. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the only thing I've really seen from the Lone Ranger as far as, like, uh, promotion things, anyway, was, like, the subway stuff, the avocado. <laughs> Other than that, I haven't really seen, like, uh, where you can get, like, like, you remember back in the day where, <clears throat> and I'm sure you were a part of this, too, like, uh, like when they when a movie would come out, whether it was a success or not, but most of the time it was a success, they'd have lots of cool merchandise, they'd have toys, oh, yeah. they'd have hats, they'd have shirts, they'd have all types of things, and just to represent the movie, and that's what I liked about that, because that's what, but that's what adds that pop culture feel to it, you know? Sure. <laughs> well, they don't have... They've got so many releases now; it's really probably <laughs> impossible to do that, and none of them stick. Yeah, you know, they, they're there maybe one or two weeks, and then they're gone again. I mean, if you, I mean, I remember when Star Wars came out; it went and went and was a big hit for a long, long time, and still relatively is. And then they had time to develop merchandising, you know, which they probably did in advance of the release of the movie. Yeah, and nowadays it's it's a it's so much of a classic. So I mean, they got new stuff coming out every year. It seems like for Star yeah. Wars. <laughs> It'll never die. But, but there's somewhere along. Look how many releases there are. Movies. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's. It, it, I mean, there still are some good movies out there, but, you know, I don't like when too many movies try to copy each other. You know, what... Yeah, what, that's what's happening right now, because one will sell, and they say, well, to one specific market, I mean, what is it, it's 20 bucks to go to a movie anymore, so you, you get a certain audience, you know, it's like, you know, most of the time it's, young male, 15 to 18, you know, and they yeah. go see action movies, and they go see, I don't know who thought Lone Ranger would be a good idea, because I don't think period movies do too well at all, and now they have a combination of uh, sort of science fiction and a period movie with the 
R.I.P.D., which that went in the toilet, too. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I was just like, what the hell is this all about? <laughs> and then they showed bits and pieces later as they increased like, the advertising. And I go, wow, is it a space movie, or is it like a weapon, or is it contemporary cop movie? And it's really hard to figure out yeah. what's going on. I think like a lot of the Adam Sandler movies, like like Grown Ups Two that just came out, uh, you know, for some reason he, uh, Adam Sandler knows how to make a classic. Uh, he doesn't make too many flops. Oh, who's this now? Uh, Adam Sandler. Oh yeah. Well, I, I did. What did the last one do? Did it do any? Did I, it I, I'm pretty sure it did pretty good. Uh, Gro- Grown Ups Two just came out what a couple weeks ago, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it did pretty good because the first one is a classic. You know, everybody. Lo- I have the yeah. first one on Blu-ray actually. It's, it's a pretty good movie. But what I'm saying is, like, he, what I'm saying is, he doesn't. I think that's my boy. Wasn't he? That's my boy. That one yeah. I don't think did too well. Well, I'm, I'm not just talking money wise, though. I mean, I'm talking like yeah. you know, humor wise, and, and I know you're more of a business type of guy, so it's always about the, the, the dollar. But I, I also look at uh, like story wise, like you know, if it has a good story, and even if it flops in the theater. You know, it doesn't mean it's going to be a bad movie that nobody will ever want to buy because that they said the same thing with Detroit Rock City. You know, that was a, a movie that uh, Adam Rifkin did, and, and that didn't do so well when it came out, but it became a, a cult classic once it came uh, out on video and DVD. So, and people remember it to this day. So, <laughs> something like that. Anyway, yeah, well, the thing is, I really don't have opinions about them because when you're working on so many, I mean, I've read over a thousand scripts. It's like you don't really. You're just trying to get the thing sold. You can't say whether it's good or bad because if you had an opinion about it, it's like it would affect how you thought about marketing it. Yeah. Well, it's like how they do with The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz will always be a classic no matter what. And and just think oh, yeah. about how many different things that they brand, how much, you know, in the money market anyway, to brand that movie, to make it a classic, but all the merchandise and all, even the remakes that they're trying to do, like with the, what the Oz, Great and Powerful Oz now, or whatever that just came yeah. out not too long ago, they, they're always trying to make it better than, than the classic, but they don't realize that the classic is, is, will always be the best, you know? Yeah. So. And Star, uh, Star Wars is the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, kind of. It's got same. One of the things it has is that a lot of people. Uh, it introduces each character separately. Each character has its own look, its own color, and shape and form. And each character has its own voice. And then they all get together and then go off to see the, the Oz figure. You know, which yeah. is like in the same in, in Star Wars. Oh sure. Well, I, I want to. Well, before we wrap this interview up, I, I have one more question to ask you. Sure. But. Uh, I just want to say ahead of time, just thank you again for letting me do this interview with you. Uh, you're, you're definitely a guy that I wish I could actually meet in real life, you know, because you, you I, I think we have a lot in common <laughs> sure. when it comes to oh, pop culture. You're a movie fan. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not so much marketing-wise, but maybe uh, on, on reviews on movies. But but we, we, we like pop culture, and that's what keeps, uh, that's what keeps us going anyway. Uh, the last yeah. question I have for you is uh, basically, do you have anything that you like to promote right now? You, you said you're doing a documentary or something. Yeah, like we're that? doing a. Uh, we're, 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 I've been through a couple producers on it, and we're we're it's in that teaser trailer essentially. But we're working on a documentary, but it's kind of a faux documentary about things that I've done and all the stuff I've done. But it's just not like me as a talking head. We tried that already. It doesn't, I just don't want. Any, I don't think anybody's going to come to see me. <laughs> Talk and uh, they do when uh, when I when I speak at different places, but it's kind of like specific audiences, you know, advertising or design sure. at schools and 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 agencies and uh, agency organizations. But so we did this with a very famous or uh, well-known documentary director, and he shot a bunch of stuff. And I looked at, it and I go, I don't think anybody's going to come to the theater to see me talk about this stuff. And so we came up with that format that's in, that's sort of that concept that's in the teaser trailer with them, basically, and it's like these two of these movies have just came out now about these Chinese girls getting all into having the money to get into pop culture and buying the designer labels and the um, the whole idea that they, when we were working on this stuff, there was still an, uh, there was still an Iron Curtain, there was still the Cold War, and uh, and people in the other in East, Eastern Europe wanted American products, and we were promoting those, promoting Levi's, and promoting all this stuff. And then finally, the wall came down, and you know, people used to pay well over a hundred bucks, you know, for a pair, trying to get a pair of Levi's in East Germany. 
so the point is to say that well, a lot of stuff I did, a lot of stuff I worked on, just sort of Americanized the world, good or bad, and made them want what we have, which we had all this popular entertainment and, and all the other stuff, and games and jeans and uh, cars and motorcycles. That was the whole consumer culture that they wanted, and sort of sort of broke down the wall between the east and west. One of the producers that I got enough to want to just to be me as a talking head, I go, no, nobody's going to want that. That's not interesting enough. You know? <laughs> what we really did is, is and now as I said, uh, if you look, um, again, you know, in China now, they're trying to emulate what Americans do, you know, yeah. dress like and buy, and sure. whether that's good or bad, who knows, but it's just, <laughs> that's sort of what we did, and that's, to me, like the important thing to build a movie around is that me and my clients sort of did that because that's the kind of stuff I had sort of a reason one of the things I got into this stuff because I used to do cartooning and I used to did stripes cars and I used to do flames on cars and you know all the illustrations and lettering car names and so I kind of had a feeling in what I could do for what like movie titles look like which a lot of movie titles aren't necessarily type but you know hand lettered titles like uh, Jurassic Park and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and then those are titles we came up with which are more um, entertainment oriented and comic oriented motion picture oriented than just working with basic typography and so when I go to I went to an ad, a couple ad agencies that had motion picture studios as clients and they couldn't come up with these kind of things because it just wasn't in their background so that's kind of how I got to keep doing stuff uh, in popular culture uh, branding and it went on even to do a baseball team and so on and we did all the uniforms for the natural uh, and uh, the, the logo on the uniform and things like that I did we designed a lot of stuff for Apocalypse Now that we shot on camera but it's, it just goes back to sort of always being a kid you know reading comic books and watching movies and TV and working on cars and surfing and sure. there was a lot of people in my time who had that kind of experience because a lot of advertising people even out here in California came from New York and just had all these sort of city references and all of them had more of the classic kind of looking because it was like right after the time of Mad Men and so that were advertising all sort of looked like Doyle Dane advertising like Volkswagen advertising in the 60s so they get a movie account they don't know what to do. You know, what do you do now? You yeah. know, how do you how do you make this look like a movie and not look like a Volkswagen? And then then with the record uh, record business, I was an offshoot of that because I got asked to do uh, Ry Cooter covers and I and Tina covers, and George Harrison cover, and so on. It's like because I had a feeling for entertainment and I had a feeling for music, and it just worked. Into that. There wasn't a lot of people sort of. So the thing about the music, there were people doing work in music business and doing covers. So a lot of them, on the other hand, didn't have a basic advertising background, which I also had, where I could sell things with merchandising concepts as well as, you know, the look of the cover. I could sell the artist on the cover. And then I also did a lot of editorial work and um, magazine design. I redesigned Rolling Stone, turned it into a magazine at the time from the fold over. And, and, but that's because I already had an editorial experience, and then I knew what was popular. What they weren't doing right in the magazine was really merchandising the acts with big photographs. You know, they always had a photograph on one side or one, a photograph on the other side. So we changed it to what was a magazine format like it's And then you could have a double page spread and run an artist across the spread. And I think the first one I did. I think was Greg or Dwayne Allman going across the center, you know, right oh, where the yeah. staples are and everything, oh, which sure. they would never do because they had this border around every page in the old days. And so I redid that. And I did some work up for Flint. I did a uh, redesign Hustler for him, and then I did, uh, he had two other magazines, one called Chic, which he wanted to be very upscale, like a, like a better penthouse. And so I designed that for him, and then he came out with one later. Actually, it was his wife's idea. Uh, called uh, Rage, which was supposed to be a little more targeted younger, like Maxim. But we wanted to make it a little more better designed and a little hipper. Wow, so you you just done everything. <laughs> yeah, magazines <laughs> and advertising wow. and uh, uh, 
So uh, what is this? Records. Yeah. So what is this uh, documentary supposed to be released? Now when we get it made. <laughs> oh, so you're still working on I mean, it? We've been on it forever, trying to. You know, like I said, we shot a lot of stuff, and <laughs> basically, I've got somebody I know pretty well. He's a he's a director of. You know, he's a cinematographer and he's also an editor, and we've been going over to because I should send you. I could link you to a talk I just gave, which just shows a lot more. Um, of what we think it kind of should look like and where it should go. Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. I, I, I think you were trying to send me that a while ago, but it didn't. Some of the reason I, I it, you, uh, you sent the, the link, but uh, it did, it didn't work for me. I don't know why. I don't. Uh, I mean, because it's not just a paste and cut it. Yeah, yeah. It, it won't link directly from an email for some people. Like, like you have to, you have to copy and paste in your own know, your browser bar. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and then uh, people can check you out on your website as well. You want to tell them what that yep. is? Mike's yep, everything, there, most everything is there. And your website address for people that want to know? Oh, Mike Salisbury, M-I-K-E-S-A-L-I-S-B-U-R-Y, L-L-C, dot net. And you got lots of so anybody that wants to check you out. Uh, I would definitely recommend it. You got lots of stuff that uh, is very iconic that people would know, and then even some stuff that people probably don't know that you uh, that you were a part of. Yeah, probably. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's I was just trying to think to talk to you some more, some more about like just ads because we've been talking about motion picture posters, yeah. and record covers, and magazines, and then I did a lot of advertising work too, which which can be seen there. There's a category. I hear there's two categories. There's one called Top 40, which is a lot of everything, and then there's another one, Greatest Hits, which uh, is like the most memorable stuff, probably. Oh, cool. Yeah. I've been in photography. I've been a photographer for Vogue and Bazaar and Esquire and... Uh, Jeez, you should be a, you should be a billionaire by now with all the work that you've done. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> Well, that's why I say it's an honor to talk to you because uh, you've done so much stuff for pop culture, and it's just kind of neat to get somebody to talk to somebody that. Because uh, I've talked to some big name people. I mean, uh, other than yourself, I mean, I've talked to Lou Ferrigno, uh, the oh, guy. Cool. I've talked to him. I've talked to uh, Henry Thomas, who was uh, Elliot and ET. I've talked to Butch Patrick right. before from the Monsters show, and I've talked to some some big name people. But it's just it's nice to talk to other people too that uh, are kind of behind the scenes that that people don't really remember or never heard of but yet with you you've done so many different iconic things I'm surprised they haven't made like a, a Time Life a magazine about your life and career yet you know like they oh, do with everybody yeah, I've got a lot of them there's been a lot done already uh, <laughs> I mean I have a like a big box full of a lot of this stuff but most of it's trade oriented you know for the design and advertising business no no no, no. What, I'm, what I'm saying is that you know like what they like Time Life will pick like a, a person or a subject and they'll oh, be yeah. that they'll be the focus of their magazine or whatever, like they did with Neil Armstrong and Clint Eastwood. They yeah, should sure. they should do one on you like that, and I think people would uh, people should learn about you. I think that that okay. would be good. I, I I would definitely buy a copy if I saw your face on on uh, Time Life and say Mike Salisbury, uh, Mister Pop Culture. I'm just like I've talked to that guy before. I know about him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Hasbro, we did the Hasbro logo also. Yeah, and and. Uh, that's uh, the one that does the Transformers, G.I. Joe, and all that. Yeah. Well, they, they, they were. I don't know if they are anymore, the biggest toy company in the world, but they they go all the way back to Mr. Potato Head. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That which they use that in the uh, Toy Story, all three Toy Story movies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, man, I could talk to you for hours. I mean, on, on all this stuff, and, and I'm sure they would probably take a long time to actually get through every little thing that you've done. I actually have a book. About all this stuff, it's it's not. It, uh, you can find it in Amazon. Just look, for, search my name. It's, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd be interested. Oh, art either. director. Art director confesses. Okay. And uh, I mean, we I don't see the cover. Maybe I'll cover <laughs> the um the uh, I'd send you one. I don't have any left of my own, but the um. I'm not sure I'm trying to think of anything else I could say, but it's okay. all here. The, uh, I mean, I've done advertising for Volkswagen, even TV, uh, uh -huh. and uh, Disney. We uh, I did TV for Disney, did the 30th anniversary logo, and then we called in to um, help them rebrand and refigure out uh, 
California Adventure, oh, which wow. sort of flopped when they first brought it out. Did you ever do any work? There's a guy that I talked to a while ago on the show here that uh, who also was the Ronald McDonald from 1984 to 1991. His name Squire Friedel. Have you ever worked with uh, him before? No, I haven't worked. He's he's uh, also known for like doing like uh, Toyota commercials and and uh, I think that's probably one of his biggest. But he's done like over three thousand like radio and TV commercials. So oh. yeah, so I, uh, just like narrating or being a part of the oh, voiceover. Yeah, so I don't know if you are familiar with him or not. Or he's out of California too. He does like a winery or whatever. But uh, but he was he got his start like as an actor. Uh, way back, like in the sixties and seventies, did some shows, and then uh, did a. Uh, he was his biggest claim to fame was the uh, the commercials and being the uh, Ronald McDonald uh, character from nineteen eighty four to nineteen ninety one. Oh wow! That's <laughs> see, I know some stuff too. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever see Ed Wood, the movie Ed Wood? Uh, I I probably have seen bits and pieces of it. I don't think I've seen the whole thing though. Oh yeah, that's our campaign too. Okay, okay, wow, Ed Wood. If you, now, if you were to say that you did some stuff with Back to the Future, I would be really impressed. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that, that one. <laughs> I love that series, and I also love the Ghostbusters series as well. I was a big fan of Ghostbusters 1. It's more or less oh, part you 2. Know, you should, um, on Facebook, you should hook up with Michael Gross. Yeah, I actually, I actually did an inter- interview with Michael Gross. <laughs> oh, good. Cool. I did one uh, here a couple weeks ago, actually. So I oh, yeah good. yeah he he definitely told me all types of stories about his his uh, work on Ghostbusters one and Ghostbusters two and all the Ivan Reitman films that he helped out a lot of them oh, cool. I, a lot of them good. I own on DVD and Blu-ray so it's uh, pretty cool I really uh, I think that's probably where I found you actually uh, to be honest it wasn't just your website it was actually I, I go all around and send a uh, interview request to people here uh, you know uh, uh, through Facebook as well and I, I seen you were on Facebook and then I just clicked on your website link before yeah. I sent you a friend request so yeah <laughs> so that's we all did cable, we did speaking of funny movies we did Cable Guy although I don't know if it, most people think it's very funny we did that Basic Instinct yeah I remember Cable Guy Cable Guy was uh, I think <clears throat> Cable Guy was kind of one of the movies that kind of got Jim Carrey kind of started more or less kind of put him on the yeah. map yeah yeah Oh yeah, yeah. I, I love Cable Guy. I actually enjoyed the uh, the soundtrack as well. I thought that was a pretty good soundtrack that they made yeah. of, of the movie. So, well, I tell you what, Mike. You know, I uh, I appreciate having you on. This has been a, a real treat. And uh, uh, everybody, go check out his website and uh, and, and uh, just remember, you know, it's good to know where pop culture comes from. You know, it doesn't okay. just come out of the air. <laughs> or maybe sometimes it does. But thanks for. Well chatting with me, Mike, and uh, okay. I appreciate it. Okay, no problem. Thank you. All right, bye. <laughs> and that was Mr. Mike Salisbury, and uh, yeah, he uh, definitely a, a great guy overall, and uh, as I say about pretty much everybody that I've chatted with, of course, just to, because I think it's kind of neat that we that I you know get this opportunity to, to chat with some of these big name people you know, it's all a surprise, like I say, you know, it's, uh, you never know who, who, uh, who's going to come up, but I can tell you right now, we got two, uh, upcoming guests, uh, this weekend that I'm also going to be chatting with, uh, the lead singer of, uh, well, guy who was a part of Wild Cherry and, uh, the, the Jaegers, I believe, uh, his name is Donnie Iris, he's a rock singer who went solo, uh, has started a solo career like in the late 70s or early 80s, and, uh, still to this day at the age of 70, is still rocking it out. Uh, he'll be a guest on the show. And also, speaking of Wild Cherry, I actually found the actual lead singer, the guy behind the whole Wild Cherry uh, legacy, uh, 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 Rob per- Parisley. Or per- or I probably just chop his name. The guy, the lead singer, anyway, of the of the, the group, the guy behind it, uh, Rob Parisley. And uh, he'll be a guest on the show, too. So I hope you guys uh, look forward to that. And... Uh, We'll probably be taking a little bit of a break here after this weekend because uh, I'm going to be moving to South Dakota here on Thursday, uh, next Thursday, August 1st, so I don't know where I'll have internet right away when I get... Uh, but we are expanding the Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture series to September, so because I might be taking a little bit of time off from doing some YouTube stuff for a little bit. Taking a couple weeks off, anyway. Got to get a job and everything, and, and 
go from there. So, anyway, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time for another great Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture interview.